Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be at BYU once again. My wife and I reside in Weezer, and of course, if you ever want to stay with us, you could share the house with theological books, old records, old radio gear, and old people. <laughs> so at any rate, it's always good to be back with our BYU friends and associates. As my background suggests, I have written a book from my master's thesis on divorce and remarriage from a Middle Eastern point of view. And the reason was I saw so many people who I felt misunderstood the New Testament statements in Matthew 5.31 about divorce. And I felt the Aramaic phrases actually implied something different. And that uh, all of the definitions from our Greek statements were not completely examined. And so if anyone you know is going through a hardship and they're in a state of emotional distress and they feel religiously there's no way out, I have very good news. There is. And therefore, we can be scriptural, we can understand the word forgiveness, and how it applies to the healing of an individual, and we can always, always get right with God. And so there's good news there. So I hope you will take advantage of that. In my professional opinion, many of these subjects need revisited. And I'm going to use a bullet train approach. We're going to just stop at many train stations for just a few seconds as we go through the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. And we're going to look for its Jewish influence and Semitic interference on our Greek text. Are you ready for the ride? It is really something else. So I tend to preach and teach my way through things. So if I tell a bad joke, please laugh. And uh, it, if I use lots of words you don't understand, well, I'm good at ducking uh, with the artillery. So therefore, I think we're ready to proceed. In the early centuries of Christianity, within the first 30 years, Christianity was a part of the Jewish temple cult. The rites the Jews practiced, so did the church. It wasn't called the church yet. We were not, of course, called the way at that point, but in the aliyahs of Isaiah, Ezekiel, the ancient paths, the way needed to be reestablished to Zion. And yet we had cultural and religious <coughs> clashes growing up. We had a Hellenistic state, writes Bernadette Broughton, who utilized women in the synagogue and they read the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the scriptures out of the Greek Septuagint. And of course, that had a great impact on the Greek Orthodox Church from the Thessalonians into Athens. And yet, what happened? We saw great tension and persecution begin. And therefore, if we go back to the letter of the ancient writers, which talked about fleeing to Pella by Ephanineus, we see there was a church that did not separate itself from the Judean practices. 
Ephanenaeus is very elaborate. This document was found by a colleague of mine, Sam Bacchiocchi from Andrews University, when he studied at the Vatican, and today everybody quotes it. The Vatican Library said we didn't know such a writer existed with such a complete analysis of what Hebraic Christianity looked like. But let us continue. Hebraic naturalism was supplanted by views of another world. The Messianic kingdom, whether or not it was to be ruled by Messiah bin David or by Messiah bin Joseph was to be an earthly paradise where Zion or Zion would be firmly established. Why do we believe the things we do? Why did Christianity end up with such pie in the sky, my and by and by? Because we look for another world to actually be a part of our rescue. We have forgotten about Hebraic naturalism that was centered around life or lahayim. Now, it was circular in nature because of the Sabbath system and we'll read about that when we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I don't leave out too much of this lecture. I'll probably leave out the important parts. But nevertheless, what you had was, in Israel's daily worship and thought process, you were either coming to Shabbat, or you were coming out of Shabbat. You were moving out of one holy day, to another. We read right over this when we see Matthew 28, 1. Meaton, sabaton. It's a coordinated conjunction that actually implies one day from Sabbath, which would be Sunday. Two days Monday, and we can do basic arithmetic. All the way to the seventh day again. This coordinated conjunction writes Daniel Wallace of Greek Beyond the Basics connects the cycle of Israel's worship and we read right over it and we look for words like epifusco and other things to deal with the Lord's resurrection and what time of the morning that he was missed. But what we forget is it was one day from Shabbat. Other things that are interesting that we do that are Hebrew or Hebraic in origin that we don't think about it. Did you know the Lord's Supper or communion is very Hebrew based? Did you know that when you look at a Catholic priest, writes Dr. Terrell Luttrell, one of my colleagues, we can find almost everything in the Levitical priest outfit, including the undergarments. When you go to a liturgical church and there is an eternal star that is way up there uh, near the apex of the worship facilities, what you have there is from an old star that talked about the eternal covenant from the ancient temple. How did Christianity change from this peripatetical rabbi, the rabbi of the people named Yeshua, who had a message? For example, let me just give you a few highlights from the Lord's Prayer. We used to study this in the Church of the East in our graduate studies called Targuma, uh, which is Aramaic uh, for just commentary. 
And for example, when we say our father, and this is very big without accident in Roman Catholic and liturgical studies. In fact, in the early church, when you got to the I fathers, the non-baptized people were told to scram. It was time to split because you were a catechumon. You weren't ready for communion yet. And so, therefore, awu, that, that's a liturgical conjugation of the term father. The term father could also mean the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their posterity would also be included in the word our father because it's the children who are praying to or giving honor to the father. Now, one of the things that our English does not give us is when it says, hallowed be thy name. I bet I could go around the room here and we might come up with things, well, it means to respect God. But in the Aramaic phrase, what it means is that you uplift God's reputation by your praise and your behavior. Now, another phrase we may not be quite so familiar with that's out of the Peshitta would be this one. The term Basham that we call the devil comes from the phrase in English, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from what? Evil. Some manuscripts say the evil one, obviously meaning Satan at that point. But you have 10 different meanings of that particular ter ter uh, term, Bashan, because of the fact it can mean miracle worker, deceiver, archangel, uh, somebody who's conning you in a bad deal. So you don't want to go down those particular roads of deception and temptation, do you? Makes a lot fuller sense of what the Lord's Prayer was really trying to tell us. And yet it is so simple. The word, Amen. You know, you hear preachers say, Amen. And amen. What does mean? Yeah, you know, Hallelujah. You know. <laughs> and what happens there is, in the Aramaic tongue, it means sealed with trust and truth. Isn't that beautiful? So when we say amen, it's not to just say, I believe it, brother. I believe it, bro. You know, it really is more covenantal based than that. I'm giving an oath by my word. See, it's a personal pledge. Okay, so that is some of the natural readings that we can get out of the biblical text from just understanding it within its Semitic culture and also beginning to realize that there were terms which we'll get to that found their way into the Lord's Supper in the New Testament and when you read it in Greek it was a word that was applied to the Savior gods. That word was Dighton that Paul uses. But he's recasting it to apply to the Lord's Supper. Let's talk about that if we could for just a moment. The word panium, meaning the face of God out of the book of Exodus, is to be a part of the bread that we take called the afikomen when we go into Hebrew studies, the center loaf that's brought out at the end of a Passover Seder service and is revealed. And of course, the term is memra in Aramaic. 
But when we think of it in our Gentile frame, we get a completely different meaning out of this. We're correct when we say that the Lord's Supper is a covenant ratification. That goes all the way through the atonement in the everlasting atonement until the 22nd endowment takes place when we receive our Stephanos, our crown in the kingdom of God. This is also a part of covenant ratification that began with Simchat Torah when the law, the Torah, was given to Moses and 70 other nations, according to rabbinic tradition here. From my paper, The Hebrew Roots of the Lord's Eucharist. Once the people were assembled, the law would have been given with covenant stipulations. Then the people would recite back to Yahweh, all the eternal has stated, thus we will do. How many knew that was a liturgical response when they read it? We just think the people are saying it. Liturgically, the people of God were permitted to march up the hill to Zion or Yahweh's presence where they would meet God face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. Face to face is also called the bread of faith. Exodus 25 and verse 30, Panium, which was used in later temple services to symbolize the face of God. The bread is hidden manna, which is found in Psalms 78, 25, as well as the everlasting covenant offering in Leviticus 24, 5 through 7. Once the ratification of covenant giving of the law at Mount Sinai was completed, the people were permitted to climb up the mountain to reach God's temple. After being admitted into God's presence, in his presence, a covenantal wedding supper was celebrated. The temple services, which had developed two cups of drink prior to the Passover meal. This was the Kaddish, which the mixing of the water and the wine was based on Deuteronomy 26 and verse 3. The wine was symbolic of receiving the land and covenant renewal. Isn't that something? When we take of the Lord's Supper, that is some of the doctrine that should be behind it. If we understood that, would it mean more? If we thought about that covenant ratification and what it means to becoming God someday and being exalted into the kingdom of God, maybe we would take it in a more sobering manner. But what happened? Let's go back to our timeline here. Judaism was in the temple cult. And there were curses which would come about later with the 19th benediction. Separation would begin to happen as Gentile converts would come in to the church. And there began to rise up two houses. Now, whether or not God actually wanted that, the Jews saw that with the book of Ruth, there would be many people through Judaism who would come in through Old Covenant stipulations, which 
our presenter stated so beautifully. And yet, what do we do with this Jesus Christos in Greek, Yeshua, in the Hebrew mindset? How do we keep them together? Well, various attempts were tried. 49 AD, of course, they settled the table manners issue. But you know what? The ultimate coming together pictured in the book of Hebrews and the book of Ephesians was never fully realized, said my mentor from Claremont, Dr. Charles Dorothy. So the houses never came together, even though Ephesians 2.15 would want the veil lifted and of course, with Tahagia, we would look through the veil as the book of Hebrews talks about for the unity of God's people. That never occurred. Now, unfortunately, there was less, less of the Hebraic church actually that was transmitted through the Latin fathers. There was a great deal more of it that survived, of course, through the Eastern Fathers of the Church, where original sin would never be accepted. Eternal marriage would be continued in some Orthodox jurisdictions. And I've done that ceremony where you bind the hands with the robe of the priest and uh, pronounce the couple worthy to set on crowns of glory and receive their Stephanos in the crowning ceremony where they marry just as ancient people did in the Ethiopian church to this day. Stephanic and other scholars have said that this crowning ceremony is so old and ancient that the theological implications have never changed. Stephanic says these particular crowning ceremonies where they switch crowns to set on a love seat someday in the book of Revelation when the final covenant will be inaugurated. But there was a chasm between the Hebrew church and the Gentile church that could not be easily dealt with. By the hand of ordinances, wrote Paul, Chironife dogmata, there by the hand of ordinances that were held against us we should not bow, he said, to the philosophies of men in the book of Colossians. And yet, there was a reef, a breaking of the covenant that began to separate the people of God as we head towards apostasy. This reef is written about in the Gospel of John. And of course, the people were separated. Judgment begins where? In the house of God, declares the book of Hebrews. There was a lot of concern that a breaking of the Lord's covenant had taken place. And yet, what was the remedy? I said earlier that even in the Lord's Supper, the term dipnon in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 was also used to give offerings to the Savior gods. And so therefore we began to see this influence on the New Testament with God our Savior. And so... As we move in our story 
very interesting things began to be debated. In the world to come, there is no eating or drinking. Think about that ascetic statement. But the righteous, set with crowns on their heads, fasting on the brightness of the divine presence, for it says they beheld God. Now, notice what they did. You couldn't eat or drink in God's presence. But now, when God was present, you could eat and you could drink. Just like it said Jesus did. Jesus was the final Todah. It said in the world to come, when you continue reading these tractates, the Messiah would give bread and would give wine to fulfill the sacrificial system. Another community fulfillment of communion or the Lord's Supper. This was also known to complete the Feast of Tabernacles when all of the sacrifices of all the nations and the enthronement of Yahweh and the Messiah or Yehoah would take place. A very beautiful picture of all the marvelous things that we fulfill without always recognizing the significance of what we do. Now what was also interesting is if you look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 13, Jesus taught as a peripatetic rabbi. He had in-house teaching given to his disciples about the kingdom of God. And notice what he says there, unto them it is not given. He had a specific emphasis for the 70. And of course the 120. And of course the general gospel invitation to his lordship that would go to all humanity. But to the coleto, to the called, to the assembly, to the disciple, the maturese, the disciples, there was a special in-house type of teaching that was given for those individuals who Christ taught directly. The book of Revelation pictures this. And it does it in such a way that it is liturgical action from the early church. When you read the book of Revelation, you are reading how they worshipped. The book of Revelation draws heavily on flood narratives that became seas of people who would be saved at the end of time. It also depicts the Exodus wanderings of Christ, fulfills the Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, chapter uh, 5, verses 7 through 9, as the people of the Lord call him their Passover. And of course, that would be Revelation 15, or the new Exodus. This new imagery, provides a new temple, a new lampstand, new holy things, a new Pentecost, seen during the church age, a re-giving of the law through the Spirit from Red Adashah as the harvest of Revelation chapter 14. The anointed times of God's holy days are revealed through the opening of the seals and the blowing of the shofar, or the trumpets, as the final trumpet sounds, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord. And at that time, Revelation 11, verse 5, at that time creation shall break forth with a new song, a rewritten song of Moses, Revelation 15, and verse 3. 
the Hallelujah Chorus. This is drawn from the Qumran Caves of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Sabbath Scrolls 4Q400. And in the manuscript 4Q405 corresponds to Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 and 2 picturing a new creation where the Lord will ultimately tabernacle with his people, with a new Eden, and, of course, a new age of divinity will occur. In conclusion, if we look through our New Testament, our Brit Hadashah, and we read it with a Semitic lens, what do we see? We see the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7 with water drawing ceremonies from the book of Jeremiah to promote a new healing and new harvest. We also see other beautiful imagery in the new birth that corresponds to Dionysus in the Greek world, but the new wine is taken and applied to a new situation. We can look through the veil to a better day with a whole new creation imagery to take place with a new priesthood for all people, just as the Lord has always wanted in Exodus 18. We can look to the Gospel of Mark, which was seen in the temple service as the new Haggadah. In a 1961 publication by Dr. Bowman in Australia, where he went into the temple service and dissected it and felt he could find even some of the hymnody in the Gospel of Mark. Dr. David Flusser put it this way in the School of Jerusalem. Without a Semitic understanding of our Brit Hadashah or our New Testament, which refers to 90% of its verses, we would have without it nothing more than a short story. Truman Madsen suggested in The Eternal Man that we should return to the meaning of Sabbath worship in its full glory. There is a crown saved up for each and every one of us if we will allow the Lord to exalt us. Maybe, as Truman said to the rabbi, maybe we should do likewise. Thank you.